So welcome to the this session of uh, special series of uh, we will have some lectures and uh, we have a distinguished guest as you know that is Air Commodore Jaisir Singh will take two lectures today and tomorrow morning. Uh, today the topic is uh, uh, advent of nuclear weapons and its implications for global security and uh, Tomorrow, f particularly first year students may talk about their interest and how the strategic s study is important for them. So I'll invite uh, Air Commodore to address this. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I've been asked to speak on nuclear weapons and global security or what are the larger implications. My, my plan is that I will talk about nuclear weapons and what they are and what they can do or what they can't do, how we reach a stage when we still have nuclear weapons, because during the Cold War uh, there were lots of movements against nuclear weapons, but the answer that used to come from the nuclear weapon states and the allies who were protected by nuclear weapons was that there's a Cold War and there's a great threat so therefore we need nuclear weapons. So when the Cold War ended, one could talk to the same people again and say, but the Cold War has ended, there is no enemy. But then the argument was that now we need the nuclear weapons because there is no Cold War. There is only uncertainty. So whichever way you want to go, the countries that have acquired nuclear weapons are in no hurry to give them up. Uh, <coughs> India, from the very beginning, in fact, has been arguing for getting rid of these weapons. Um, surprisingly, uh, when the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki took place, uh, everyone expected that Mahatma Gandhi would issue a statement. And for the next six months, actually, he never s publicly stated a word on nuclear weapons. Mainly, uh, just keeping quiet. Yes, he did discuss these issues uh, privately, but they're not in public thing. And that seemed very surprising that here is this man who's been arguing about non-violence and etc., etc. Now, the most violent weapons have been used on innocent lives, but he was quiet. Uh, sometime only in February, March next year, 1946, then he wrote his first piece, Blasting at the Nuclear Weapon. So one of the German historian scholars who had interviewed him earlier to say that, why did you not uh, speak up for six, seven months after the Hiroshima bombing? His answer was that he was afraid that they, meaning the United States and UK, may deny freedom to India because they have nuclear weapons. Now, you can agree or disagree with his judgment, but it clearly indicated that as he saw it, he did not see this as a weapon of, actually it's not a weapon, but an instrument of politics rather than a weapon of war. Now, that's a very fundamental point that becomes very difficult for people to understand and absorb because uh, it's like war. When you say war, you actually then what comes to the mind is there's a large amount of war with tanks and armies, etc. Uh, so when you look at a weapon, and weapon is something that must has to be destructive, the level of destruction is different. On the other hand, the point, the point I want to talk to you is that the nature of nuclear weapons, because in a way it is not a weapon, and yet that therefore what is it if it's not a weapon? Uh, is it a device? Not really. Uh, like any other explosive which is used f against any target or any human beings, uh, of course it becomes a weapon. But uh, is this a weapon that can be used in fighting a war? Mm, 
yes, provided the other side doesn't have it. Because if the other side also has, may not be the same number of weapons, but sufficient nuclear weapons, then you should expect that some of them will survive your own use of nuclear weapons and you will get a retaliation of, with nuclear weapons. So in the classical sense, any war fighting between two nations that have nuclear weapons, if one side uses nuclear weapons, it's likely the end of the two countries because there will be a retaliation to which there may be, if there's still something left, there will be retaliation again. And that is war fighting after all. It utterly does that. You start firing at the other, the enemy, the enemy starts firing at you, you, you keep on firing and it can go on for months and months uh, and years. The nuclear weapons, it won't go that far. Because of two things. One, unlike any other weapon that has been invented and put into action in military cap capabilities, nuclear weapons is a weapon against which there is no credible defense. So, so you always then, if you have another country which that doesn't like you, uh, has problems but has nuclear weapons, how do you deal with that country when it threatens you with nuclear weapons? Uh, and then you find that the only answer is that you find a defense from nuclear weapons through deterrence. Now deterrence has been part of human history, human conflict from times immemorial. By and large deterrence actually meant and that is now, for a long time, it's been normally termed as deterrence by denial, that if you use force against me, individually, community-wise, or nationally, then I will deny you that ability to get the benefit out of it, either because I will defeat you, or I'll impose sufficient cost on you in terms of destruction, that you find it, it is simply not cost effective. So that is deterrence, really speaking. To this, in the last hundred years, has been added another dimension. And that is, you can deter somebody by the sheer threat of punishment. That if you do, if you threaten me and you, or you start a war with me, I can simply punish you through the use of aircraft and particularly at a much higher level an aircraft carrying nuclear weapons. From that process we have evolved into now nuclear weapons in their full-fledged form. At one level the world had about 67,000 nuclear warheads. Well, that's a phenomenal amount. Uh, in the late 70s and early 1980s the normal strategic literature used to talk about there are enough nuclear weapons to destroy the world 60, 60 times over. And I had a problem in understanding this statement because you can destroy the world once, how do you make it 60 times? Because it's enough, uh, much, much less than 60,000 warheads are required to destroy the world completely. I think this was talked about that th that's the reason why, why Robert McNamara, uh, when he took over as the Secretary of Defense, he had been in the World Bank, he was a lot more focused on uh, empirical, even mathematical answers. So he said, well, we can't just go on blindly building bombs and delivery systems, we must define our goals. And the goals were defined that if to destroy a country, in that case was the Soviet Union, that as long as the 25% of the population and 50% of the industry is destroyed, that state will, st will stop functioning. And that formula of 25% and 50% is an empirical formula that still exists. 
which also then starts to be calculated in terms of when you have if you if you have an adversary who which doesn't have nuclear weapons then you have I don't want to use the word freedom but you can use even one or even a threat of it will be enough to change the policies of the other state the problem comes when the other side also has it then what do you do then you are and I'll come to that in a little while because it's important for us in India to understand uh, the nuclear weapons in terms of its I mean, what sort of animal is this? What you can do with it? What is it that you can't do with it? What will it do if you don't handle it properly? When you look at nuclear weapons, and look for deterrence through nuclear weapons, and deterrence theory is very long and complicated. I'm just putting in the simplest language to say that we have, I will either deny a victory or raise the cost of the victory so much that it is not worthwhile for you to attack me. I can also do that as long as I have aeroplanes and then missiles came into being. That deterrence through punishment. That you have a threat of punishment which will make you not take the action which is not uh, for which I will have great problems if you, if you are to follow those. So then there are differences in shades of opinions and interpretation between the two words, deterrence and compellence. Obviously compellence is when you are actually on the offensive with nuclear weapons. You want to compel the other side to do something. And if you don't do it, I will destroy you. Much more applicable to circumstances when one side has nuclear weapons, the other side doesn't have nuclear weapons. The nuclear weapon state can actually simply has to gently, very politely tell the other chap, don't do it. It's like if I stand here carrying a Colt uh, repeater revolver in my pocket, I don't even have to take it out. As long as you know that I'm carrying it and I said, no, you sit down and listen to me, I'm afraid you'll have to sit down and listen to me. Whether I'm talking nonsense or, or not is not the issue here at all. So that is how human, human race has existed all along till it got to a, this new animal. Now, what is therefore so special about this nuclear weapon? Number one, I have said, even today, there is no credible defense against nuclear weapons. You can ask me very clearly that then what about the BMD? Because it has been talked of as defense against nuclear weapons. The funny part is that the title itself tells you that it is not against nuclear weapons. It's a missile defense, ballistic missile defense. So it's a defense against a delivery system which may or may not carry nuclear weapons. Now when you are talking about neighbors which have common borders, things are start to become quite different. But bulk of the things in the beginning were between the Soviet Union and the United States. So even when they got to missile, aircraft would, have, would take at least two hours, two and a half hours uh, to reach on the other side and drop a bomb. But when the missiles came into being after the end of 1950s, even then the best of the missiles would still take when going over the North Pole to any target in the United States or Soviet Union and vice versa in approximately 25 to 30 minutes. So even if you had information that, that, that a nuclear strike has, has begun, you still had time. And that is why many things that happened actually were dealt with that way. This lack of defense is what creates not only nuclear weapons, in any weapons. For example, when the missiles were first used with conventional warhead in Second World War, the V1 and V2 German bombing of uh, uh, British cities, mainly London and Coventry and others, 
One was a cruise missile, the other was a ballistic missile. The cruise was still subsonic speed and a lot of them could be intercepted. But the ballistic missile which then goes up uh, with the power of a rocket and then it comes down de depending on the ballistics of the uh, of that particular re-entry vehicle. So you can actually plan it and work it out in a way and because they these these such weapons were not accurate, so it could only be used uh, on an as an area weapon on a big city and things like that. Uh, Churchill, Winston Churchill, in fact, uh, the problem was that when the V2 was started to be used, uh, there was no real defense against it, and it didn't carry nuclear weapons. Churchill actually ordered the chiefs of staff to examine whether we should go in for chemical weapons against Germany or not to stop these attacks. The chiefs of staff actually came up with, with the answer after the study after two or three days to say this is not advisable. So the invasion plan of Europe, the Operation Overlord, was modified to put one third of the total invasion force to immediately move to the east along the coast, get to the launch sites of uh, the German V-2 uh, ballistic missile and destroy them because a lot of bombing took place but they could not actually write it off. The missiles still kept coming. My point in doing this is that in normal human life. Certainly when it comes to things like missiles and nuclear weapons or even artillery shell for that matter or, or air attack, there are big enormous political psychological factors that start to impact. Uh, because the target country, the target people, whether soldiers or non-soldiers, actually become helpless because there is no defense. If there is some sort of a defense, then you still have hopes that it will somehow neutralize it. So a nuclear weapon on a ballistic missile is simply cannot be addressed. When we get the missile defenses, it will stop the missile. But I will come to that because there are changes that are taking place even in that process, which like President Putin announced in 2004, that we have now a ballistic missile which will defeat any missile defenses. It will get through, guaranteed to get through. So coming back to this, the problem is that per weight or per unit or whatever we, uh, criteria we adopt, the level of destruction that a nuclear weapon causes is horrendous, absolutely. What was used on Hiroshima and Nagasaki was only about somewhere between four 12 to 15 kiloton of, that means 15,000 tons of TNT equivalent. It's not a very powerful bomb. In today's terminology, uh, Cold War terminology, it would be called a tactical weapon, not even a strategic weapon. And yet, the two superpowers went on to not only develop thousands and thousands of missiles, tens of thousands of nuclear weapons, but also in terms of yield, 5 kiloton of 20 kiloton weapons were invented, which could actually just, you know, create enormous amount of damage when it gets to the other side. This combination of lack, lack of credible defense and the power of this destruction combined then now gives nuclear weapons an enormous, enormous political, psychological advantage to which there is no other way out to deal with it. No. Hence, therefore, the role that nuclear weapons play in international relations and geopolitics is basically of changing the equation of power between states. But what about 
fighting a war with such weapon then? That's an option. Uh, also, there has been in more recent history, or the last 50 odd years, there have been two wars between nuclear weapon states. The theory says that the moment nuclear weapons are used, it will go into escalation. But both these wars remain very limited, very, very limited, very consciously. Not that you have sign agreement with your enemy, but the enemy knows that if he escalates, it will, you'll, the ladder will simply go up. Like somebody said that the nuclear ladder has only one rung and you have to then go straight on to the top. 1969 was the war between China and the Soviet Union on the Osuri River. Again, territorial dispute. Where it tends to, both countries had nuclear weapons, but they didn't use it. They also did not allow it to expand from that very localized area. The second case is India-Pakistan in 1999 on the heights of Kargil sector. A vicious 42-day war. The Indian Army and the Indian Air Force had very strict orders not to cross the line of control. Now we're talking about, and I would have liked to show you the, the slides and the pictures of that area. You can, but you can imagine in, in fact, you can't imagine the, the Himalayas at average of 14 to 22,000 feet altitude and the valleys at that time either snowed up or otherwise their fighting actually took place. Because in Kargil area, there was no cover of trees or anything else. And the Pakistan army had actually come through during winter and occupied places so that as winter started to wear off, these people already were there, virtually looking down on the single road from Sirinagar, is to go to Leh and further up to the north. The aim being that now you can keep hitting all the traffic that goes in it. By and large, there were due to be 3,000 trucks per day that delivered uh, uh, supplies to the civil population of Ladakh and also the military population on the Chinese front border, as well as in Siachen and the, and the uh, line of control. So if you can reduce that to half, and then the winter comes in, next year, Indian Army would have been, not have been able to actually fight, because you don't have enough supplies. But the f fact is that wars have taken place. On the other hand, logic tells us that unless this may not be possible every time. The control of escalation. If you can't control escalation, which was the case in the, during the Cold War, and in most cases, because the, on both these examples are actually unique examples. One was more a tussle over an island in the river, as to who is going to have jurisdiction and sovereignty on that. In this case was that Indian aim was very clear to push the Pakistanis out of this side of the line of control. Pakistan also remained controlled in that sense. We used the Air Force, but Pakistan all did not even use the Air Force, which is a different story altogether. The point is that for a very strong control over even conventional fighting, where nuclear weapons are owned by, by states. Otherwise, nuclear war fighting is out of the question. In 1986, uh, President Reagan and President Gorbachev at uh, Reykjavik had made a joint statement that nuclear war cannot be won, hence it must never be fought. It was generally understood and accepted that therefore we should get rid of nuclear weapons. That then the officials and the bureaucracies on both sides and the military didn't want to go down that route. 
uh, even after the Cold War, as I said, the pr process has been painfully slow about trying to get rid of these weapons. Right. Therefore, the only option that you have, the only utility, if there is a utility of nuclear weapons, politically or military, militarily, you find that the military utility is rather extremely limited to a limited war which you can control at a, the lowest possible level. Political utility is enormous. So there is here a mismatch. Normally, when you say war, war must end rational political objectives. Clausewitz had said that war is an extension of politics by other means. But nuclear war is not an extension of politics by other means because both sides will get destroyed. And that was brought home vividly during the Cold War when both sides had reached levels where if they were to be used, both sides would have been destroyed. And that's how the term came in, mutual assured destruction. It so happens that the acronym for that is MAD, which is absolutely true. It would be madness to try and attempt that sort of a thing. So from then on, was really speaking, things moved on to how to manage the arsenal, how to manage the uh, competition between states and trying to prove the superiority, how to build, retain your own alliances, and how to make sure also that this uh, terrible weapon does not spread, the non-proliferation issue. But in terms of utility, we need to give a lot of thought. In terms of historical facts, one can say there's only been one incident where two bombs were dropped on two or three, on two different days, on two different cities. Uh, that's 19, 1945 in early August, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Interestingly, the United States had actually kept about seven, eight cities in Japan where normal bombing was not allowed. So that if the weapon, if atomic bombs are ready and, and they're used, then you can know that what is the actual level of destruction that the web, web causes. Slightly callous on the face of it, but then life is like that. Luckily, so far, as of date, no nuclear weapon has ever been used as such. And if, as long as countries understand that the use of nuclear weapons will lead to this, especially if you want to in indulge in f trying to fight a war with, which will happen if you have tactical nuclear weapons. Because there is a belief then if, that if the yield is very low, then the destruction is also comparatively much less. So we had and during the Cold War, and even now some of it, that are all the way down to artillery shells, the micro nukes used to exist. But again, we draw, we need, in India at least, we need to draw the right lessons as to how did this happen, how did tactical nuclear weapons come into place. It's my view, in my experience, having studied this for the last, oh, I don't even remember now, I think, well, at least 50 years, half a century, if not more, that there is no such thing as tactical nuclear weapons. Provided you define tactical nuclear weapons correctly. Unfortunately, tactical nuclear weapons at times have been defined by the quantum of the yield. That if it is below 20 kiloton, then it's a tactical nuclear weapon. Or if it is carried by an aircraft, normal aircraft, that's a tactical nuclear weapon. You know, the strategic weapons will be those who carry enormous, you know, at least one megaton, if not more, where you go in for strategic targets. The other name for tactical nuclear weapon that evolved through these decades was uh, battlefield, battlefield weapons. That means that it, the use of this will remain confined to the battlefield. Uh, 
I admire the optimism of those people who felt that they could actually use such things and things would remain normal. Uh, logic will tell us that if one side was to use the smallest possible nuclear weapon, let's say point 0.1 kiloton, the other side also uses one weapon, 0.1 kiloton, then the first att attacker has not achieved anything. It's static. So he's bound to, if he has the weapon, he's bound to send the next one, which is, let's say, one kiloton bomb. The enemy might respond with a five kiloton bomb. So you have a very rapid escalation to the maximum that you have. In my life, in my personal experience, I've had long sessions, discussion on these issues in the early 80s and 90s with, on one side, the chief of the general staff of the Soviet military. Depending on how we look at it, the most powerful military leader on that side. Also, some of the most powerful military leaders of the United States on the other side. Including, he is no more, Robert McNamara, who a wonderful person. For years and years, we were.